Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it's March 25th, 2022, and uh, and it's springtime here in central New York. I know that some of the viewers live in all different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and uh, and a lot of the people who are who have turned who have tuned in to this uh, channel are interested in gro growing their own food, homesteading, some of the things that we share on a regular basis. And uh, last night or this morning uh, of a, a one of the news feeds was this article that I wanted to share with you. And I'm going to share it with you in a rather unique way. Uh, I think it's unique. Uh, since I'm dyslexic, I suck at reading articles and all. And I think that this one's really done exceptionally well. And this is in The Gardener's Path. Uh, it's how to plan the best layout for your vegetable garden. I know that when you when uh, people look at what we're doing and what we're growing on our property, it can seem completely overwhelming and too much information, too quick. He's going too quick with the things and he's got hundreds of videos and all. Uh, and I thought that this article really at, at least offers a clear and concise uh, way of creating a plan for starting off and to it, it, in a very logical way. So this is uh, Kelly Spicer, single parent at a young age. Uh, she, she really became somewhat frightened by the possibility of uh, food insecurity. So she started being a, a self a self learner. And, uh, and so what she's done is she's actually created a beautiful place in Florida and she's sharing that information with others as well. So um, I thought what I do is is go go through her article, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this yet, but I'm going to have my uh, text to speech synthesizer help me through this whole process. Where to start? Every gardener has a different scenario to work with. The size and layout of your space, the vegetables you intend to grow. And the time and effort you can invest will be different from one person to the next. Taking stock of your garden area. If you're starting from the very beginning, the first step in planning is assessing the area you have to work with. Ask yourself some questions as you observe. Where does your plot receive the most sunlight? Are there shady spots that would be a better choice for shade-loving plants? Make a note of how the sun exposure changes throughout the day. Do you have a slope where water runoff might pool or the ground might remain too wet for some plants to thrive throughout the season? Have you tested your soil, and will you need to amend it prior to planting? Are there plants such as trees or bushes that might interfere or compete with certain crops, such as pine trees whose needles create acidity in the soil below? Some species do not make good companions. Does your region experience harsh weather conditions that you need to plan around for the best chances of success? Keep track of the seasonal temperatures and frost dates for your area to understand the local weather patterns. How much area do you have to work with? Measure your space for length and width. You'll need those measurements to calculate how many plants you can comfortably fit without crowding or wasting space. The best way to organize all of this information is by writing it all down in a garden journal. You can find some of our favorites in this roundup. A good journal is indispensable. Choose one that you can use for several consecutive years as this will help you to identify patterns and trends such as pest infestations, crop successes and failures, and changes that you can make to improve your outcome at harvest time. Plain graph paper can also be used, although most journals include graph pages for layout planning. Use a grid to create a scale model of your space so you can play with different arrangements. So I th thought I'd stop here for a second. The, the additional thing that I would say during this initial um, uh, phase of creating a plan is to take into account what's going on with your neighborhood as well. Uh, so are there people who are, so if you're in a, um, in a, uh, in a densely populated area where there's really not even lawns, there's just concrete areas and all, 
looking around and seeing what else what else other people have been doing now we've we've used uh, rain gutter gardening uh, and that has been very successful uh, you can use uh, container gardening that are that are on top of self-watering rain gutters as well there are many people that that create uh, beds on top of concrete and she's going to go through some of these things but looking around seeing what sort of birds there are around in your area uh, what sort of flowers and plants uh, neighbors are growing uh, and seeing, you know, if they're interested, finding out are they interested in, in any of these things. Uh, on the lawn that you have available, if you do have lawn, what's some of the history of it? Has, some, is it, has it been a really well manicured and taken care of uh, lawn? Is it something that you have to worry about pesticides, herbicides having been used there that may be uh, residual in the soil that may create problems? Uh, what is the soil type? Is it real rocky? And again, like she mentioned, are there, are there spots where the water pools? So most people have these cameras nowadays, uh, their phones, and they can go on out there and take pictures. And as the day goes, goes, goes by, taking different pictures of, of your, your area that you're thinking about growing in, taking pictures at first thing in the morning to say, okay, the sunlight is hitting this patch of ground at this time uh, how many hours is that area exposed because if you have a large trees and buildings around there may only be two two hours of sunlight hitting it as opposed to a good eight hours of sunlight so that th those would be just some additional things that I would think about at this point use a grid to create a scale model of your space so you can play with different arrangements now you just need to figure out what you want to grow Deciding what to plant. After you have the lay of the land, you can decide which crops you'd like to grow. One of the primary considerations to make here pertains to size, how much area will each type of produce need to allow for adequate room as it matures? Start by making a list of the vegetables you enjoy eating, and consider what percentage of your total diet you'd like to be able to pick from the garden. Research the mature size, or spread of each type so you can plan for the amount of square footage each will need. And consider height as well, as tall plants can overshadow shorter ones growing in close proximity. Once you have an idea of the spread of each, you can better decide which to include and how many of each you'll need to provide for each person that will be enjoying your yield. For example, if you don't have enough space to add more than one pumpkin vine to your plot, you may want to choose something else instead, since you won't get much produce from one vine. Next, use the data that you've collected to decide which of the varieties you'd prefer to grow will fit your specific circumstances. If you have some shady zones, you can include leafy greens and root vegetables, herbs, and brassicas that will enjoy the cool shade for part of the day. Bright. Sunny spots are perfect for nightshades such as tomatoes and peppers, as well as squash and beans. You can also make use of wet zones by planting perennial plants such as berry bushes or asparagus that will enjoy the extra moisture. With this list of veggies and fruits, and the layout and conditions of your plot in mind, you should do some research to determine which varieties make the best companions. Some aren't suitable neighbors. If a lack of available space in your yard restricts the size of your garden, get creative and employ some of the many methods available to you to expand beyond the borders of your beds. Adaptations can also be planned out in this step. So um, I thought what I'd do is interject a couple of things at this point. So if you're, if you're absolutely brand new or you haven't been gardening in a long time uh, since you were a kid or whatever, you did it with your grandparents, I would say when you're, when you're choosing uh, the, the, your first season of gardening, uh, you know, if you're really anticipating a food shortage and all, that's one perspective that you've got to take into account. So you want to think about how much food of the foods that you like can you actually get produced in the square footage that you have and she's going to talk about square foot gardening in a minute and there's plenty of of uh, sites that have information on it so knowing geez how big does uh does a broccoli plant 
get or a cabbage plant get and how much space if you don't use a trellis will will a bush bean plant take as opposed to a pole bean uh, plant take so if you're thinking about uh, if you're very concerned about food sh shortages and you want to maximize the amount of growth and again working with neighbors or friends or family some people can concentrate on growing some crops while you concentrate on growing other crops so you can share back and forth uh, otherwise I'd say if you're not really that concerned about food sh shortages at this point and the, and the need to produce uh, tremendous volumes of, of food, then you can start to plan and say, what sort of things will offer me the most success? Or you may decide, you know what, instead of growing vegetables, which really are just one season long uh, uh, vegetables, unless you're doing self-seeding, little permaculture um, guilds and all, what I would say is consider doing some different fruit bearing perennial plants or there are perennial uh, vegetable plants as well in different parts of the country that you can grow like we grow lots of berry bushes different types of berries because we we consume those berries all winter long because we have the ability to freeze them so there's looking at what your goals and objectives are uh, when you're making the plan and that's always modifiable and in thinking about what your personality is as well, it's it's when you're thinking about gardening, it is a, a form of investment. You're investing your time, money, uh, space. You're occupying a certain amount of space and, you, and different materials you're purchasing in order to do this this endeavor, starting a garden. So it's a significant investment. And you always have to think about what your personality is. So are you a risk taker or do you want to be very, very conservative when you're doing uh, this investment? So like working with it with the stock market with this volatility going on, I'm a pretty aggressive and the volatility of people buying and selling stocks really doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I do my research and I know what, what my goals and objectives are and I stay the course unless something fundamentally changes in that company and it's the same thing when we're looking at a garden uh, so you need to think about geez we have seasonal flooding here or we have hurricanes and all so you have to think about how you're going to protect it, what, what the likelihood of these events are, and certainly what your personality is. I really want short seasoning. I want the, vet, the vegetables that will turn over quickly and I have a higher chance. And if there is an extreme weather event, I wanna, uh, I'll want the opportunity to replant and get a second harvest. And certainly climate, the temperature, all of these things play a role. But this is a form of investment and your investment strategies and your, uh, will, will change as time goes on, but having a good sense of what your comfort zone is with success and all. Like Thea really wants, my wife really wants uh, a high degree of security where fear of pain and failure are just part of what my, uh, my fundamental learning uh, systems involve these fear pains and failure where Thea doesn't like those things at all um, not that I like them but they're, they're uh, once I'm gone the, the the safety will be the the main thing that she will want to deal with with me I'm willing to take some risks and to, and take some challenges um, so without any further ado let's get back to this adaptations can also be planned out in this step Methods to consider. There are a number of ways that you can increase your territory, make chores and car retaking easier, or even plant vegetables that don't fit well in the existing conditions. Let's take a look at some of those options. Vertical gardening. One option for increasing available area is vertical gardening. Using trellises can increase the number and types of plants you can grow. P-fence of this P-fence from Lehman's hardware can be expanded horizontally, and this a frame garden trellis, also from Lehman's, offers two sides for climbing plants to grasp. A frame garden trellis this method is perfect for including vegetables such as cucumbers and pumpkins in the garden without dedicating half of your ground to their sprawling vines. 
Vertical growing also works perfectly for smaller plants with shallow root systems, like lettuce and spinach. You can hang pots or recycled materials, such as 2-liter bottles, from a fence or other structure. Learn more about vertical gardening here. Square foot gardening. The square foot method has been around for over 40 years. You can pack a lot of variety into a relatively small plot with this technique as you use a grid pattern of square foot blocks to section your rows. So this is a, a really cool system and uh, this is a way, it's, it's not market gardening, but it's a way of doing market gardening in a very small uh, you know, yard or even in your parking lot and all. And you can see that what, what this person has done is they've, they've got their brassicas in different locations, their, their lettuces and all, and they probably have beets right in here. Uh, so realizing just how much space each plant will take and you can maximize the yield. And then there's a way of modifying the square foot gardening where you're leaving some space so some uh, if you have uh, shorter days of maturity for some plants like your lettuce and spinach and all you can plant those in the same square foot as some other plants that will take longer periods of time like carrots to grow to get to mature size and you can phase them throughout the season so if you always want to, if you don't have freezers or you can't do canning those sorts of things or dehydrating which are all the methods that we talk about in this on our uh, uh, website or our youtube channel you can actually uh, as long as you know how many days to maturity those plants take you can plan your square foot gardening or market gardening techniques that we use uh, to accomplish those missions. So here we go. You can pack a lot of variety into a relatively small plot with this technique as you use a grid pattern of square foot blocks to section your rows. This method has its pros and cons. You can increase the number of different types of vegetables that you can produce but you may sacrifice a bit of potential yield. Closely grown crops significantly reduce weed growth but can stifle air circulation and more easily spread disease. It's especially important to use companion planting methods to avoid the latter of those issues. However, the square foot technique can produce great results in an urban setting where it can be a challenge to garden at all. Learn more about planning a square foot garden in our guide. Container Planting there are a few reasons why container growing is perfect for expanding your plot. If you have a very small area to work with, there are many vegetables that will be right at home in a container. Some vegetables that might not fare well in your growing conditions can still be grown in pots and moved to better suited places, such as the patio or a sunnier or shadier location. You might also choose a container if you have a sprawling variety that will take up a lot of space in the garden beds and you'd rather pot it with its own trellis. Learn all about growing vegetables and containers in our comprehensive guide. Raised Beds You've most likely seen raised beds as they're widely used and trusted for making manageable sections or beds. Elevating your growing zone above the ground allows you to provide richer soil in the smaller dimensions of the bed rather than dealing with the entire area of the plot. If your soil is generally poor, they can be built in any width. So I, I, so I thought I'd stop right here for a second. Uh, raised beds uh, gardening. Now we we create our raised beds, our permanent raised beds. Uh, most of them without the uh, using the lumber or metal uh, those but we've grown in um, in uh, galvanized feed tubs and plastic bins that you can pick up at uh, the uh, the box stores the, um, uh, the the plastic bins for mixing mortar that sort of thing uh, we've used various timbers to create borders but one of the key benefits of, of, of growing food in raised beds, and if you've got a, a reduced area of property, is that as your, 
you get your kitchen waste, and I'm not talking about fit, you know meat and dairy products and, and all, but as you generate that waste, you can always be amending it. And in a couple of my videos, I talked about using a five gallon bucket with holes drilled in them and, and using that in your uh, beds. Because what ends up happening is all the red wigglers come in and start to break down that th those food particles in those five gallon buckets that are set right in your permanent raised beds and that goes out and feeds the uh, the rest of the plants in the garden bed in r constantly feeding the microbial community in the soil in these permanent raised beds and some people will go ahead and save it up and compost it separately and then amend uh, work that compost into the soil or you can uh, use fertilizers and other amendments like other people do we don't do that, but it certainly is a way of going about it. They can be built in any width, depth, and configuration that you need and even raised to waste level to eliminate the need for bending and reaching. You can also add some roll covers or netting to protect your plants from hungry critters. Honestly, there are too many benefits to list here. We'd be here all day. Instead, check out our raised bed guide to learn all about them. After deciding which of these methods will work best for you, the next step is learning how to document your results. Why is this important? Read on, I'll explain. Keeping track. Making notes throughout the season is a vital part of planning your garden for the next year. If you don't keep track of your results, it can be difficult or impossible to remember important information like rows or beds to rotate with other crops to prevent the spread of disease or pest infestation, or which fertilizers work best for which plants. Having a clear, concise record of the outcome of each growing season and the methods and preparations you used will make starting over next year much easier. Eventually, it will help you to develop a rhythm that can become second nature. In the first section of this guide, I mentioned garden journals. Arranging all of this information in a clear order makes it easy to flip back to last year and consult your practices, whether they were successful or needed improvement. There are also apps and websites that you can use to store the data and notes you collect, if you're more comfortable using technology and for going hard copy. Add notes about which seed companies you had the best germination rates from, what time of year you tilled the soil and added manure or fertilizer which vegetables suffered from infestations of pests that might overwinter in the soil, and any other information you might need. Beginners and seasoned gardeners alike need a plan. So I thought I'd interject here as well. Uh, one of the things, like most of us have smartphones nowadays, and so with a smartphone, uh, two tools, now I've talked about using Evernote, uh, and I think Evernote is great. I'm starting to use Google Docs and, and Google Sheets, the, the, the spreadsheets, similar to what we use for Excel and all, or word, um, word processing documents like Docs. Really good ways. And this has a camera on it, and you can take pictures and then, and then uh, annotate those 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 photos as well so really taking good keeping good records and if you see a pest or if you see a disease process taking good accurate photos as the disease progress uh, uh, progresses uh, so those are all really important tools that you probably all have on your smartphone beginners and seasoned gardeners alike need a plan if you're a new gardener Parts of this process might feel a little overwhelming. Breaking it into bite-sized pieces over a longer period of time can help to prevent overload. Starting to plan the year before or well in advance allows time to find your groove. Using methods that simplify and make curry taking easier can help as well. What methods have you tried? We'd love to see what you've come up with and hear about your results. Still have questions? We're here for you. Feel free to ask in the comments section below. So I thought that this article was, I thought it was essential for this channel for people who are just starting out and, and taking into account, um, you know, the, the, 
the idea of starting to become more resilient, more self-sufficient. And there are more and more people that are, that are thinking about homesteading as well. And I just thought that this article by Kelly Spicer here was fantastic. And, uh, and I'll be on the lookout for other articles by her. And again, this is uh, one of the Gardener's Path, which I don't regularly see. It just came across my news feed because these are sorts of the sort of articles that I'm always looking for so I can share basic ideas because people ask me questions about topics that seem very related to what we're doing here on our site. So that's it for today's video. Let me know what you think about this format and me using the text-to-speech synthesizer here in my computer to share this with you. You know, if I was a better reader, I would do it myself, but, uh, but I, there will be a link below. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your feedback. If you found this of value, please give us a thumbs up. I think that this is a great article to go to. It'll be listed in the description below. And by all means, folks, think about gardening. It can be amazing, even if you start small. Take care now. Bye-bye.